Yeah. Yeah. Um, the movie with the paper. I never got the paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just thought about it. Like, last year. Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Likely story. Yeah. No. Okay, so you look at the essay you have. There are a few choices. How many essays do you have to do on Monday? Three. I'll show, tell you what you need to have. We've already talked about, hey, we've already talked about writing a thesis statement in here. For what I want for a thesis, we did a practice yesterday to wrapping the bell right. And we're going to do another one. Or you'll have to write one of these, or a thesis for one of these two. You come into class, you start writing right when the bell rings. And also take out the sheet I gave you on how to write an essay. S-A, S-A, writing tips. Did I give you this? Yeah. I'm not sure when you told me you were in Scampton. <laughs> okay, so, S-A, writing tips. Man, we talked about yes, or what day we do? Wednesday, we did the thesis statement, talked about thesis statements, and I really get that. And the whole idea is I won't have to do it again. I'm going to give you that basic idea of point and position, S. Y, then A, B, and C. Got your blueprint? Yes. I also don't have that. Can just take that one? I have all the way over here. I just want to make sure you get your steps in. Oh. Yeah, I do, you know. We got an issue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? That's all. That's all. <laughs> okay, so with that, first thing I can say before, read the question and make sure you know what you're answering and then you address it. Now that looks like math. I'm almost positive I don't need a math assignment. So that will go away or I get it and I file it away over there. This is not study hall. Okay, so with that, read the question carefully. And then, what I said was a brainstorm list. And a brainstorm list, that is where you have to go back and try to remember the, the material that you don't have. This is actually a really helpful exercise. Because, well, first off, always going to forget stuff. And just like anything else, start bringing things out, they'll trigger memories. But the other thing is, when you write an essay, it's so easy to forget stuff. And if you don't write it down and don't think about it, it's easy just to just get something in your mind, start writing, and that's always a great feeling when you're halfway done and realize, oh, I forgot something big. Or even better, right after you hand it in and realize, forgot that. This helps avoid that. Just a quick brainstorm list. And the way we do it is, I'm still with this, is okay, when I first started doing this, this I got from a teacher this a long time ago, and I used to hate it. I don't want to do this, I just want to start writing. Because don't forget, the number one thing people want to do when they start writing an essay is to do what? Finish. Get done. Right? Don't we just want to get done? So you get it, let me just start writing. Well, this actually makes it easier because you don't forget stuff, and if it makes it easier to write the essay, you in the end run, in the long run, save time. I just made like a, like just kind of a fill up wise with, with basically people, events, places of that era. And I found out a better way, and I'll tell you more in a second, but just a little column right here. So before you get into that column, I want you to think about something for a second. Look at those two essay questions I gave you. The Industrial Revolution. Think about all the people and events and places of that era from approximately 1800 to 1850. Of, you know, not just in the Industrial Revolution, but there's all kinds of political and other issues. I know we haven't covered them all in class, but we've covered a lot. You start listing them out, we start just even talking about it in class, also other things start, you start remember, and things that you might have know better, just forgot the term, might be better for an essay. So think about it for a sec. Events of the Industrial Revolution. People, events, and places. Everybody think about it for a second, and then just call them up. We'll just do it right here in class. Just wait a sec. Is it with thought? Mind focused? Like a laser beam. Okay, begin. Last one. Say it again. Say it, what, what? Henry Clay. Oh, Henry Clay. I, Sorry. I thought it said intergalactic. <laughs> <laughs> it's fifth period. I think it's integral. What? That's <laughs> another. Yes. Railroad. It's good. That's another. What? Embargo. Yeah, good. That's another. 
Mm -hmm. Seafoams. No. What did you say? Factories. Factories. Very good. No. Agriculture. Agriculture. And someone said, yeah, good year. Education. Education. What's happening? Canals. Huh? Canals. Canals. Good. What's happening? Temperance. Good. Another one? Yeah. Immigrants. Another one? Great Awakening. Another one. I know it's kind of hard to say domesticity. Is there another one? When do economic system create? Capitalism. What's another one? What was that? Religion. Changes religion. Another one. What war? War of 1812. What was that when there's only one political party? One political party. Oh. There are good feelings. What was that? No West, no European interference, interference in the Western Hemisphere. Monroe Doctrine. What was the transportation? Or the Industrial Revolution began? Where did it begin? Who brought the factory system to America? Well, first, second. So we went through all these. They start like Eli Whitney. Start going. Doesn't it trigger memories? And some of those, hopefully, you you knew them all. But it's amazing how that works out. And that's like this, where we literally get just covered it. It's not a big a deal. But think when it starts mattering, all of a sudden you get an essay about something you haven't had for three months. Even if you study it, you're going to forget stuff. It really does work. And it takes a few sentences. And I'll show you how I stole from a student, but how a good way to organize it. So we talk about thesis statements in class. And then the next thing, once you figure out your thesis, which you've already kind of outlined it, then you have to write an outline. I expect organization. There's nothing worse than getting a disorganized essay. Outlines will organize you, you know what to write. But the big thing about an outline is, and this can't be understated, there's no, you know what I mean, when you start getting tired, your hand is tired, or you just want to finish, the clock is running, that's when you forget stuff. That's when you screw up. That's when you make mistakes. If it's outlined, it's easier to go back and look and you won't forget what to write down. You won't get off what you need to do to answer the question. It really does work. That's when it really matters. Really. I said really like eight times there. So let me give you an example then of an outline that I use. I need something like this. So here's my question. Evaluate the following statement. Dogs are the best pets. Now before you even look at the thesis, this is the way I stole this from a student. She would write, at first I put them all up here. She put it down on the line here and then put her outline and everything on the other side and the reason why she just said oh i see it better but the big reason you see it better is actually for almost everybody when they look at a paper or look at something they do better going left to right or back and forth or right to left than up and down they just see it better and so this way you don't miss facts you need for the essay and so here's my quick brainstorm list. don't look at the outline yet but have things like you know breed dog breeds if dogs are the best pets, we're evaluating that state. Driving skills, breath, moocher, reading, jaws, rabbits, fur, slavery, tails, chest, kitty litter, pizza, etc. Right? These are all dog-related topics, right? You're not a dog person. And then here's my basic generic thesis statement that has the main point of the question about dog. Evaluating the statement of the position and a very brief but basic out, uh, blueprint A, B, and C. Due to many positive attributes, dogs make the best pet. So I, I got the, the main point of the question. I address about dogs being the best pet. I said there are many attributes that make dogs the best attributes. That's my why. That is the position I took. There are many attributes, and what are they? Intelligent, loyal, and superior artistic skills. Dogs really are pretty good artists when you come right down to it. Now. That is one way to answer it. There's another way. What if I don't agree with that statement? Using the exact same format, but I change it a little bit. So you know I had the X, the Y, A, B, and C. Everyone know what I mean when I say that? If you missed, I'm sorry, but you have to go back and look at it. But for this one, if you disagree, you still have to address the statement. And that's where you get although A. So something about dogs, X to Y to B and C. That's if you have a contrary point of view. You have a counter argument. 
That's how you bring that into your thesis statement. You don't have anything in your thesis statement that will not be addressed in your essay. It's got to be in your essay. Other things you put in your closing or your opening, and I'll talk about that in a second. So here we go. Here is although A. Because of dogs' many liabilities, cats are the best superior pet due to their intelligence and independence. So I address the question, I take a stand. The first paragraph will be about dogs' liabilities. And the next two will be about independence and intelligence. And so, this is what I want for an outline. Something like this. Now, I am just so ingrained because this is what I'm talking about. I think junior high, 40 years, over 40, 50, 60 years ago, one, two, <laughs> Roman numerals, and then one, two, three. But dogs, liability, just a couple words. I know what I mean. If you write it, you should know what you mean. If you don't know what you mean when you write something, then that's more of an issue on you. I don't want a lot of words there. Just imagine you have like one or two minutes, you're just trying to organize so you don't forget stuff. Just one or two words. Which, by the way, then you will be allowed to bring this into class on Monday. A very brief house, very, very brief brainstorm list. You can have your base thesis there, which you can re rewrite again. That's one sentence I want you to rewrite, so it's well done. And an outline, which is one or two words per point. That's it. You're not writing your essay with the outline. But I'll let you have that. I want good essays when you come in on Monday. And then you will turn this in. I'm not going to make, make a big deal about grading it. I just want to see them going. So, yeah. uh, can we write a conclusion? If you want to, you, on the conclusion, you can have something like one or two points. That's it. So you can have, I didn't put it back, I didn't put uh, part of my conclusion in here, but you can do that, but that's it. But then again, if you thought it that much, you, you're, you know what you're going to want. And so, based on like a short idea of it, I put down two, I put down three, but two to three examples of it, that's all it is. Here, here, and here. So we have dog's liabilities, can't drive, dog breath, and dogs are moochers, right? Right? Even if you like dogs, terrible breath, right? Cats, better cooks, love chess, and kitty litter. All that's true about cats. And then, of course, cats love to read, they find better jobs, and do not fear rabbits. <laughs> All of those are examples. Two to three examples for each one. And that is an outline. That's what you can have. Any questions on that? And if you could, and you abbreviate absolutely as much as you, as you can. The abbreviations aren't for me, they're for you. The big thing is just so you don't forget something. Everyone got that? And here's another thing. Every paragraph or body paragraph needs a topic sentence. When I say a topic sentence, you know what I mean by a topic sentence. You probably all heard that. This is where you show a complex understanding of a question and that you are, that you are answering it with full analysis, tying things together. This topic set, so this is a little bit outside the uh, a short idea, you need a topic set, dog's liability, directly in your thesis. Intelligence, directly in there, et cetera. That sentence has to be there directly for your thesis. If you do that, you show a good understanding of the question and show that you are organized. Trust me, somebody reading that will look at it and say, wow, this person knows your stuff. Remember what I told you, timed essay, a limited amount of time, it's good to have a formula to put it in so then you can write what you know. Don't reinvent the wheel. And if you can do this kind of writing, then more creative writing where you have more free, we have time. It becomes that much easier. So for the brainstorm list, are those topics kind of like under the board? Exactly. These would be some of the ones you could use here. And you might not use them all. But the point is you'll remember something. Hopefully, in a situation where you're under a little stress, you can remember something you might have just slipped your mind for a second. And that's all you can have. Let's look at one more example really quick. Here's a serious question. How did the institution, institution of slavery lead to racism? Yeah, that's what we call a serious question. Here's my brainstorm list. Do you remember this stuff? Labor, Jamestown, all these are all stuff we've had, right? What do I mean by bacon? Yeah. So. Quick, and I could have just put down I or you know indentures that's out. I mean, just quick, get it down so you don't forget. And then 
although I use this format again because slavery wasn't or there wasn't racism because of or what there wasn't uh, racism because of let me backtrack there wasn't slavery because of racism it, was, it came out of it so I want to say although slavery is introduced to the colonies to address a shortage of labor so that's my although a the ensuing class conflict coming with Bacon's rebellion would lead to racism by the way that's I forgot how to spell wool Walled. So, <laughs> labor, bacon, racism. And like, those are some of the facts I use. Those would be the examples I use. It's a neat and easy way to do it. You don't have it exactly like that, but I really like the way she did it. She turned out to be the first student I ever had. This is a while ago. She was probably before you were born. But she got a perfect score on both the ACT and the SAT because of my teaching. And so with that, <laughs> obviously not, but um, she, she had a combination very intelligent, but also, you know, did not get stressed out and let take a test. So much of taking a test and doing these things are just being able to focus when times are a little stressful. And she was really smart. I assume she still does, I don't see her. Here, I got a few more examples. If you go to my webpage, these are all there under sample outlines. So I have a few more, right? And then, of course, what's your favorite food? Chocolate is spirit food because it tastes good. <laughs> That's very simple. You can have that. And so, let's get to the rest of the essay then. A quick outline, as quick as you can do it, just a few words, and you can have that. And then, if you look down there for number five, introduction paragraph. I don't want to make a big deal about this. I, I always thought it was hard to start an uh, essay. You get that right word. As people say, you get something that will grab people. That's hard to do. Maybe it'll come to you, maybe not. But what we want for this type of essay is in that opening paragraph, lay out the context, big picture, what's going on around. If I ask you about, let's say the essay was religious changes, religious changes during the 1840s. The big picture is the Industrial Revolution, expansion westward, all the stuff going on outside of it. For the Industrial Revolution, you have expansion westward, new political system, the War of 1812 had just ended, sectionalism north and south, big picture. And this question right here, uh, let's not worry about chocolate. Racism, talk about brand new colonies, new colonies. Um, Colonies that, like these joint stock companies that needed to make money, and they have this new um, crop they can make a lot of money off called tobacco, but they don't have workers. Big picture. Does everyone get what I mean by that? Two reasons. First off, it's a good way to start. Good way to show that you know what's going on. Kind of fill it into a bigger picture. But here's the second reason, and this one is very practical. On the AP exam, for the essays, you have to have context to get a point. So why not get in right in the beginning? It's a good way to start. It hits them right there. And like I told you, they're going to grade it. Good answer, you get a good score anyways, but give them a reason to give you that point. Get it in there. And that's a good thing to put in the closing paragraph, too, if you have time. Maybe tie it back together to the big picture. If you have time. And then paragraphs, topic sentence, to do like a short idea with a couple of examples. But here's one thing. You know, I always have related to something else. What do you have to relate it to? Remember I said relate to your thesis? But what do you really have to relate it to? Your topic sentence. Because your topic sentence is your thesis. So that's what you need to do. And at the end of a body paragraph, you need transition. So like, if I say here, Bacon's rebellion, the fear of another rebellion like Bacon's rebellion will lead to the slave codes, which directly led to racism. In the next paragraph, you talk about racism. Something to keep it warm. And in your conclusion, it is good to kind of tie back to some context, but what's another thing you probably heard in other classes to do in that closing? To restate your one. Yeah, just basically address your thesis one more time. If you have time, just show how that you you have yet. You basically um, address the question. You're basically you took how you address your position. 
But here's the deal on the timed essay. The clock is ticking and you're running out of time if you have to skimp on a paragraph and skimp on the closing. In a timed essay. In a timed essay. Because the important part is your introduction in the block. Get those good. I mean, if, you have, if you're at the end and you just want to write, and then everything ended. Okay, that's better than than skipping on the body where you need the information. Any questions? Are you happy? Are you ready for this? Do you want to do it now? No. I don't either. I don't want to grade it now. But the other thing is, you look at that. Some of the things, helpful hints on the bottom I've already talked about, but do not use first person personal pronouns. It says to evaluate something. Don't write down I think. Write it as fact. Don't put down I or you. You would get this. No, write down people or citizens would get it. And don't say the United States is we or us or are. No, it's the United States. Get used to that on essays. I know in conversation we all do that. But on essays, short IDs, everything else, make sure you get used to doing that. It does make a big difference. If you write first person personal pronouns, it sounds like an opinion. So everybody come in with that. We'll be ready to roll then. Right? Come in with your outline, paper, pencil or pen. Black or blue, please. You know that everything we write with a sentence has to be on pen by pen second semester. Everything you turn into me, I mean, not everything you do for outside the class. I'm not going to hunt you down another class. <laughs> I assume you're typing in this, or what are you doing? Yeah, good. Why a pencil? Why a pen? Huh? Is good. Pins easy to write with, but you do make mistakes. You just got to get used to it. It really does. If you, the sooner you get used to writing with a pen, your hand doesn't get doesn't get near as tired because you have to press as hard. And I press down really hard, so I I learned. Got to make fewer mistakes. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish up where we're at. There's no questions. You can have that outline. Oh, and if you want to have this sheet out just to remind you of stuff, you can have this out too. I want really good essays that first time. I want you to. I will grade it for facts, obviously, but I want good essay. I want it to feel good. I feel happy. On my website, I have a bunch of sample thesis statements. I have a bunch of other things in there. If you go back there and check how to write an essay or a DBQ, quick get that in, and then we're done. Oh, did everybody who wants to take the AP exam pay? If you did not pay, you totally forgot, like, oh, God, I forgot. Maybe in the next couple of days, you might be able to beg the counselor or Mr. Zanto. There's always maybe a grace period of a couple of days, but then that's it. That's it. Go tell them, you know, my, my dog caught fire. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, have you ever seen animals sometimes they truly combust, spontaneously combust? My did that. Your hamster blew up. <laughs> Your poor hamster <laughs> just like popped. Well, I came back from a summer camp and came back and just started to explode it as the guts go all over the place. Did you do too much? I don't know. Yeah, but no, that's the truth. Poor <laughs> thing. <laughs> what do you feel? <laughs> that gunpowder based diet might not have been the best thing. I know it tastes good. All right, so do we get to temperance and do we get to temperance here? And who wanted the temperance movement? And do we talk transcendentalist? Uh, who start or transcendentalist was to go transcendentalism was to go back to what? Nature. Yeah, when times are better and nature. And what is that conservative idea? The nostalgia to go back to when? When times how it should have been. Yeah. When time, when it should have been, when everything was so great, even though it's kind of a made-up version of the past. And, but we all have that nostalgia. And so the point is, we all have some conservative and liberal elements in all of us. Some more than others, but we all do. And race, let's see, we did the, the churches, the revivals. Give me a sec. Sound effects. Oh, you want to see something funny? 
I thought this was funny. Oh. <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> Here's your little box, kitty. Nope. <laughs> See, that's the kind of tough love you need. So we got to this. We got the Carry Nation. And I like cats and dogs. Dogs huh? Dogs are better. No, no. They're rabbits. <laughs> that's science. Have you ever seen a dog eat a rabbit? Huh? No, yeah, she, my dog's yeah that's what dogs try to act. That, that they're, comp they're compensating for the fear. <laughs> so with that, so for that, we got to this. We got to Second Great Awakening, uh, the liberal Churchill. Let's get to one more thing. All this will culminate with something that's going to be. He does look like somebody you do not want to mess with. <laughs> did I mention her yet? I did. did yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you ever do a rescue job? Kind of, but everyone's afraid because because then they would play you. Why are you Why are you arresting uh, um, this little tiny elderly woman when she's just trying to make people more wall? Swinging the axe around. Yeah, everything's relative. We come to the Protestant work ethic, and this is something that would be it ties into religion. It ties into, it ties in with everything. But you notice the term Protestant, which comes from Puritan. And it has these basic concepts that all three, you can argue, are virtuous. Number one, hard work. Work hard. But in this concept, you work hard, why? Not only the right thing to do, but there's a chance that maybe you can go to heaven. So it could be a combination of either the right thing to do or salvation. And this is true. There is something rewarding about hard work. There's something you've done on your own and worked hard to achieve it. It's a good feeling. Next, punctuality. Be someplace on time, implying that people have always been there on time. And when they say they're going to be somewhere, they'll be there. I'll, I'll explain this picture in just a second. Which, once again, yeah, there is something about that. If you say you're going to be there and say you're going to at a certain time and leave at a certain time, you're there. And lastly, temperance. This Protestant work ethic, hard work, punctuality, temperance. Do not show up to work hungover or drunk. Do not spend all your money on more base instincts and all of that. Noble, but incredibly misleading. First off, does anybody like to be moralized? And people did drink a lot before this. And it was always a little bit more complex. But hard work, if you work hard in this new system, who gets the value of your productivity? The people who have the machines. So isn't that a neat little system to get people to work hard and they think they're benefiting, but imagine you do? And nobody cared what time it was before the Industrial Revolution. To imply that people always cared was a blatant lie. But pretty soon people just came to expect that. That's the way it was. This is from a classic black and white, or of course it's black and white, silent movie from the 1920s called Metropolis, about this kind of dystopian world. It's a great movie, but they're all lined up to go work. And they're punching in. And there's people, their shift is done. They're coming out. It's good movie. Has anyone ever seen this? A couple people in my other classes have. Special topics we watched it a couple years ago. That's how it's it's really kind of scary. Of course, some of the silent movies are, are really spooky. But who would push this? Yeah, this is something they pushed on. It's something outside of directly benefiting them. And the thing is, these are all virtues. Oh, a lot of people resist it for a couple reasons. First off, nobody wants to be lectured to moralized to. Hey, don't tell me how to live. I will do this if I want to. You're not my master. And there's an element of that, but there's something else. Protestant. Not only people who might not be religious, and there are a significant number than us today, but a lot of new immigrants weren't Protestant. What were they? And that implies that there's something wrong with Catholics. 
that maybe they're lazy, drunkards, and you can't count on them. The anti-Catholic bias was huge, unbelievably huge. And so with that, we have this is a side step while this is going on. We have other changes. Urbanization. Cities, especially in the north, begin to grow as more people focus to the cities because that's where the work was. Look at 1820, just a few big cities. No real cities in the south. But look at 1860. Everyone see the just look right here where my mouse is. Now look at 1860. It's a different world. But this is what we've got to get. It's in the north. There's only one city of over 100,000, which we would consider in a large metropolitan area at that time, and that's New Orleans. Which, there's only one city of over 100,000 in Montana. The big city. And you've been to Billings, right? It's pretty scary. The traffic and chaos. Okay, so. And Chicago, just 20 years after this, is going to be over a million people. And only one city in the south is over 100,000, and that's New Orleans. The population was growing really fast up here in cities. So with urbanization leads to another big change that's happening because of the Industrial Revolution. This map didn't work. It just made, and the world became more brown. Okay, so, <laughs> changing occupations. Seemed like a good map when I first put it in there. More commercial and urban, and like we said in the north. But look at this. This is actually pretty startling. According to the census data, remember, they keep very accurate census data. Just under 80% of the population was in agriculture. 40 years. By 1860, just over half. And look at all the new occupations. Much more diversified economy, especially service is going to grow bigger and bigger. And that's everything from a clerk to a, in a store to lawyers to someone who works in a restaurant. This is all service. Manufacturing, I mean, much more diversified economy. More occupations, <laughs> but also different expectations of jobs. But one more thing, put an asterisk and add this. This right here coincides with education. What you need to know here is a heck of a lot different. You need a lot more for education here, John. Education is going to change and grow with this and become more specialized. It just, it's going to happen with the Industrial Revolution. Once again, that gets back to it's not that people weren't smart before. They were incredibly smart. But necessity would force that change. Another shift with this, and they tie together urbanization, different occupation, new immigration. Before 1820, most came from Great Britain, England, and Scotland. So, Great Britain. After 1820, this new wave of immigration would mostly be Irish and German speaking people. There's no Germany yet, but will become Germany, mostly Southern Germany. And there's two big reasons they came over. And this is actually pretty startling, isn't it? This is yearly immigration total 114,000 compared to 8,000. That's huge. And then look at that. Why? Two big reasons. The first one's famine. Second, the changes by industrialization. In Europe. Why famine? This was a worldwide famine in the 1840s. Worldwide. But most people think only think of Ireland because of the nature of the English colonization of Ireland. Because it's a famine because what crop failed? Potatoes. Yes. yes. Potatoes, this new world crop, and how do you grow potatoes? The cheapest and easiest way to grow a potato? Huh? You do what? You put it in dirt. Yes, you put it in dirt and wait. Um, the thing about potatoes, basically, it grows in any dirt. Potatoes are amazing things. Does anyone grow potatoes? There you cut it where the eye is, right? You drop it in. They're really easy to grow. The problem is that means they're all clones. They're all clones of that initial potato. Clones are genetically weaker, so they're more susceptible to a fungus, and that's the potato blight. And this was worldwide in the 1840s. It spread until it basically killed itself off at the end of the decade. And see, it's no coincidence that's when immigration numbers begin to go down again. So there was food shortages all over the world. 
This is going to lead to revolution in 1848 everywhere across Europe. But in Ireland, ethnic Irish, who were horribly mistreated by the English, had virtually no good land. And so all the land was owned by Englishmen who grew wheat. And they shipped that back to England or overseas to Europe. So what did they live on? Whatever scrap of dirt, they grew potatoes. And that was about 95% of the diet of most Irish. You can live on potatoes alone. And nothing else. There's enough protein and enough other nutrients. You would not be very happy. But you can live on potatoes. And what happened in the 1840s? It started with just a few, but this fungus spread. And the worst part was, there's flowering and leaves. It looked just like a healthy potato. And they pull out the slime. Inedible. Inedible. You, they, they tried because they were that desperate, but it would make them horribly ill and maybe kill them. And so what happened? Millions starved. And Ireland was hit the worst. By the way, what about all that grain they're growing in Ireland? What happened to food prices all over the world when the potato crops failed? <coughs> it went up. And so what did they do? They actually got the British Army to guard the grain so they could ship it overseas as a million starved to death. There are reasons the Irish hate the English. But if you ask any Irishman about their anger to the English to this day, that starts right there. That's why so many, they starve to death. Or they gathered whatever they could and came to America. Now, it was happening in southern Germany too, but it was more diversified food, so it just meant the higher prices. It didn't mean abject starvation. And the population of Ireland has just now reached the same population as it was before the famine. That's how many people died and they never affected or never moved got back. So industrialization is the other thing. Industrialization. There was a, a surplus of workers in Europe. They had a lot of workers who worked with their hands. But what's starting to replace workers who work with their hands? Machines. Machines. And what now? What do they do? And if food prices are going up because of the famine, what do they do? The Industrial Revolution hit along the Rhine River and what and places like Bavaria and Germany. So a lot of them came to the United States. And unlike previous immigrants from England, different language, Irish. Even though they're forced to speak English, there was a, diff a lot of differences because they still spoke Gaelic. But German, by the way, Deutsch. That's where they, the German immigrants are going to be called Dutchmen by English speakers. If you've ever heard of the Pennsylvania Dutch country, it's actually Pennsylvania German country. But they begin to come over, and they're different. Different culturally, different diets, different religion. And what's that going to breed? Nativism. Nativists were anti-immigrants. And this drew immediately very nativist feeling. Before you write jobs in Catholicism, write down that nativists were saying they're not real Americans. By the way, what's a real American? Remember, citizens of the United States didn't start calling them that themselves that's what Timmy could do in the War of 1812. And now they're saying these new people aren't real Americans. And part of it was jobs. In the long run, immigration dramatically increases its size in the market and therefore increases wages. But in the short run, you have these workers who are now just starting to get into the wage system. And here comes somebody else to take their jobs. And they're terrified. This leads to real insecurity. They don't want, and it's either blame the system or blame somebody who's different. And who do they blame? Here is the poor house from Galway, which is a, a city in Ireland. The idea of all the poor being sent over here to take their jobs. So that's a cartoon from the 1840s. And the other is all these differences. They're not real Americans. And it focused everything from their diet to what they drank. It focused around religion. The significant number from southern Germany and Ireland were Catholics. And as we all know, Catholics cannot be loyal to the United States. They're only loyal to what? The Pope. Whatever the Pope says, Catholics do. So they call them Popist or Papist. The areas that the Pope controlled in Italy, when Italy was all broken up, were called the Papal States. So they were Papist. 
And as we all know, if anybody is Catholic in here or raised Catholic, knows Catholics, all of you obey the Pope or anything else, right? I think now it's on your phone. Don't you have like a text, like a notification? The Pope says something, you get it. <coughs> By the way, is that true? It's not true now, and it wasn't true then. But it was a way to say they can't be real Americans. It's a way to say they're not real. And this goes back to the religious anger, religious wars, which I've mentioned before. But the anti-Catholic bias was huge, especially when this cartoon lays it out together. These lazy, drunken, unreliable Catholics will be drinking their Irish whiskey or their it's a different style of brewing, so it's called lager beer. That's German, so Irish and German, and they vote now. That's the ballot box, and they're coming to vote, change your election, to put the Pope in charge. I like that flag. Knows the ends. I still don't know why. I guess it, hey, it's 1854. Anything goes. Yeah, and then every other end is wrong. I know. <laughs> But I love this cartoon. See, no immigrants. And then look behind them. What would that be? And this gets back to the idea is okay, I might have been new or, or an immigrant or children of immigrants or whatever. Everybody in this continent is an immigrant. But in some way, we might go back 15,000 years. But yeah. I'm, I'm now an American, but now you can't. And that is a real attitude that still exists to this day. Find something different so they can't be real Americans. And they would even have their own political party. Isn't that a cool? The American or Know Nothing Party. We'll come back to this party, but they almost became the second party. In 1856, it looked like they had a chance to even win the presidential election. I'll explain why they got to Know Nothing later. Don't worry about it now. Is this conservative or liberal, the idea of nativism? It fits in with a conservative idea because let's go back to the time we didn't have to worry about these others coming in. But people can be both conservative and liberal towards immigration. You can be thinking, I believe it's good to have people of many different um, cultural groups come to the United States. It makes us economically, politically, culturally stronger, whatever you might say about that. And at the same time, be fearful of somebody who might be different. Do you get what I mean by that? There's no black and white, and so sometimes people forget that we are complex individuals. And there's also, last thing, huge class conflict. I love this cartoon. Can you see it? This is from Punch. And it's showing the monopolist, so the person who controls all the business, and they're jousting with a worker. And you notice the steam engine? I love this one. It's great. All the armor, everything. And look at the worker on an old donkey with just a hammer. And they always do workers with paper hats up until the end of the last century. I don't know why. I guess paper hats were supposed to be like you could throw them away if they got dirty. But also, and I swear to you, this is one of the reasons, to protect your hair from fire. Now, maybe this, you know, I know the jury's still out on science, but as far as I know, paper tends to be flammable. But still, I like the picture. So we have, we're going to jump right to this. Two different views of capitalism. Two different views that are going to adopt in this era. And they have the same kind of political system as we have today. And we have one group, they feel left out. They feel that capitalism is leaving behind. They're trapped in this system where they have to get jobs or wages seem to go lower. They can never get enough money to move anyplace else. If there's a bad economic time, they're laid off and they starve. And I chose this picture carefully. This is 1880s in New York. And there were hundreds of thousands of people, just like today, living on the streets. In fact, they were renting out sections. See these people laying there? Renting out places in the alley to sleep. That's how horrific it was for so many people in the big city. Or people look at capitalism, this new economic system, and say, it's amazing. Look at all the opportunities. Thus, you notice the like, a bustling street. There's, if you show initiative, creativity, you can start out as a job, maybe move up. Who knows? It's all up to you. All this opportunity, just take advantage of it. So, those who feel left out, then we got that. Those who feel left out, this cartoon shows their point of view. Here's the capitalist and the, here's the worker. Working and working with promise of hard work and you can get this money. 
and they'll never get there. That's a really a clever ad to show this idea that you're not really free. You're stuck in this, that it just impoverishes you. You're not free. Those who felt left out thought it was wage slavery. They feared capitalism. They feared the wage system. And they're the ones who would become the basis of one of the new political parties that will develop the democracy or the Democratic Party and Andrew Jackson. It's really hard to tie the Democratic Party down at this time because of the issue of the South. But still, the, the first element was that people who felt like, I have no power and I want power. The system is unfair. Jackson was their leader. This old, mean, no, actually, he's a very nice man. But you crossed him. And then those who felt capitalism was a good thing. Here's a worker astride the universe. This great system where you can get any job you want. And if you don't like your job, what can you do? And maybe someday if you work hard and show initiative and creativity, you might be a what someday? Boss. You might be the boss. This is a great system. And you know what? If you don't make it with all this opportunity, whose fault is it? Yours is not the system. It's not rigged against you. You are not a slave. You are free labor. By the way, the magazine is Puck. Yeah. I do explain that to the other classes. Hee <laughs> hee. <laughs> 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 And you trust it. And many of that would become the basis of the Whig Party. And so you're going to get a lot of workers. The Democratic Party would appeal to workers, but not all. Those who thought, I can do it. And they would become the anti Jackson Party. And a lot of workers are going to say, if the system's leaving us behind, we're going to have to start a what? A what? I didn't hear it. What? Maybe not a rebellion. <laughs> A loan out of much power. Maybe I should talk to these other workers. Union. A labor union. That should be talking about a labor party, but a labor union. What is that term for? The, more, the bigger you are, the competitive advantage you have. Um, Economy is a scale. Workers will feel the same thing. One worker alone, no power. All the workers together, economy is a scale. Which party at this time would be more pro union? The Democratic Party, if people felt left out. Or the Whig Party, people felt this system is great. Yeah. Last thing, free labor. One of you will write this down. Free labor is not slavery. Free labor is the system that everybody has a great chance. You're free to do whatever you want. Somebody will write down that free labor is slavery. Who will be? Gabriel, you're going to say. No, what's your question? Uh, who led their party? Okay. It's going to be much more open because it. Um, the Whig Party won't have a clear leader, even though Mr. Whig will be Henry Clay. But it's going to be a lot of a lot of different reasons why they didn't like democracy. So everyone know what they're going to bring on Monday? Outline, question, paper, notes, bribe. Huh? Uh, 409 to 420 we do on Tuesday, so I'll give you time. Oh. Leave my presence now. Oh my God, I just have a special topic. So my day never ends, people. I know. I'm not. Brendan, smile. Okay, you're on film.